I'm glad we're together today in this space. Uh, my name is Mark Cummins, and I'm the pastor at Church of Hope. And if you're a regular attender, welcome. So glad that week after week we join together in this space. And if by chance this is your first time, I'm really glad that we're beginning our friendship today. Now understand that this broadcast literally goes around the world for free. See, we believe that life's at its best when people discover hope in Christ. There are people who give generously so this broadcast can be reached across every continent. If you've never given, I would invite you today to give. You can go to our webpage, hopeinocala.com, and drop down on the giving bar and give a one-time gift. Or you can give generously beyond just today. And if God's blessed you, help us as we give hope around the world. But for now, I want you to open up your heart and your mind. Let Jesus speak to you because what I believe is that when we open up our minds and let Jesus speak to us, life doesn't become perfect and all the problems don't go away, but you experience his presence in you, with you, and for you. Open up your heart. Let Jesus speak to you today. Peace. Cheeseburger in, you knew about that, huh? And perhaps you saw the same news that I saw that Jimmy Buffett took his last breath on this side of eternity. You know, when actors and actresses and musicians, when people in society, culture die, it makes the news. And we've been talking about this the last several weeks. You, you can go back and check out all of those messages online uh, for yourself. But we're, we're kind of asking the question, what, what happens in life when we do take our last breath and then that very next second? And God doesn't want us to be unaware. He doesn't want us to be afraid. On the contrary, God very much wants us to be very aware. And as I taught several weeks ago, and although it sounds a little bit awkward, he actually wants us to anticipate that our lives do not end because God breathed his life into you. You are immortal. Now, last week we gathered together and for the most part, Hurricane Adalia wasn't even a thing. I mean, it was kind of a mixed up mess, didn't know what it was going to do way south of us. But as the week went on, right, it changed. And it looked like for a season that it was very much coming right across Ocala. And so the Weather Channel does what the Weather Channel does. Tells everybody the worst case scenario. Remember last year? Ian was going to come and it was going to hit us. It was going to destroy Tampa. I don't know where you were. I happened to be in Driggs, Idaho. My daughters, I, Linda and I drove uh, to Driggs. My daughters flew. The news began to spin up that Hurricane Ian is coming to Ocala. Airports were closing. So I put my daughters on an airplane, got them back in before, and Linda and I started driving. And Hurricane Ian didn't come to Ocala. Now, it did come south of us, and it was devastating. True with Adalia. Many of us prepared our schools shut down for Tuesday and Wednesday. Many of you went and topped off your vehicles. Uh, perhaps you got a little extra gas. You, you went to Walmart and bought all the water out of supply and some TP and other kind of things, right? And then it missed us. Now, the good news is that it missed us. The challenge is this. You get numb to the warning that a hurricane's coming, and then the next time the warning comes, you're like, ah, Ian was supposed to hit, it didn't hit. Adalia was supposed to hit, it didn't hit. It's kind of like the firemen 
who goes to a house fire and discovers that the homeowner took the batteries out of the fire alarm because it was chirping, beeping. Because you know what? It's just probably never going to happen to my house. Well, God has told us without a doubt that you only die once. Hebrews chapter 9 is clear. It's appointed a man or woman once to die, and then comes the judgment. And so YOLO, it really is wrong. It really should be YODO. You only die once because you live forever. And God wants us to be up on what's going to happen. So I want you to grab your copy of God's Word. And we're going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And we're going to jump into verse 12. But here's the idea is our eternal destiny, whatever that's going to be. I don't know exactly where that is for you right now. You do, I don't. But I know two things. One is that our eternal destiny is permanent. There's no mulligan. There's no like, okay, I took my last breath, I die, and then me and God kind of have a conversation. I know I was kind of supposed to sort of, but you know what? I need me a do-over. I... I, (laughs) We live in the best of times and the worst of times. I mean, like, hello, Amazon Prime. You order it. Is there anything simpler in the world than Amazon Prime returns? I mean, it's just simple. I mean, it used to be like you go back to Walmart, you could return anything. But you had to stand in that line. You had to wait, right? But Amazon Prime, oh, man, boom, just put it right back. There is no Amazon Prime after we take our very last breath. So our eternal destination, it is permanent. And the second thing is this, prayer for this morning, I don't want any of us to have a regret once we take our last breath. Let me say that again. I don't want anybody to have a regret once we take our last breath. Now is the time. And this idea this morning about don't just get ready, be ready. There's a huge difference between getting ready and being ready. All of us probably live with somebody in our house that's an expert getting readier. Getting readier. The problem is they getting readier, we're always later. We're supposed to be there at five and they're getting readier. They are really good at getting ready. Getting ready isn't ready. Getting ready is the process of being ready, but you ain't ready. As Christ followers, God wants us to be ready. And this morning, I hope to try to, with God's word, unpack what that looks like for us to be ready. So you got your Bible, right? Check it out. Look what it says in 1 Corinthians 13, 12. Now we see things imperfectly, like puzzling reflections in a mirror, right? What's God doing? What's going on? Is it the signs of the times? Who's the Antichrist? Did you see this AI? What kind of conspiracy is going on? What's the government? We see things very imperfectly tonight. We're kind of always wondering what's really happening, what's going on behind the scenes. But notice what he says. But then, there's a coming day, future tense, but then we will see everything with perfect clarity. All that I know now is partial and incomplete. Partial and incomplete. All I know is there's a storm out in the Gulf. It's churning up. The waters are warm. I don't know exactly. We have a cone. We're tracking a cone. There's a potential that maybe the hurricane will come here or it'll zigzag here or it'll zigzag there. There's a cone. That's how we live today. We live in a cone of uncertainty. We really don't know exactly how it's tracking. But notice, all that I know now is partial and incomplete. But then future, I will know everything completely just as God knows me completely. And so what I hope this morning for us to kind of learn and grow together is this coming event as you and I live right now here on earth. This is where we are. We are here today. There is a imminent event. Now I know that falls off of your ears a little bit because you're accustomed to the weatherman. And the weatherman says, right, we're tracking storms. This is my green screen. We're tracking storms and it looks like somewhere up around here and the storm's going to come down here and then it might shoot back from around here and then it'll come down from over here, right? I get it. You're kind of like, okay, great. Another, we live here today. Biblically, what we'll see 
from God's word today is there's this imminent event that the Bible calls the rapture. The rapture is not the second coming of Jesus Christ. The rapture is when believers will meet together with God in the air. The second coming is when Jesus comes back to the earth and he rules for this thousand years before the millennium. But what I want us to be really aware of is this event that's about to happen and where we stand today as living here on the earth. So check it out. God's word, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We've been here for a few weeks. This is an important piece of scripture for us to understand. Notice what it says. And now, dear brothers and sisters, we want you to know what will happen to the believers who have died so you will not grieve like people who have no hope, right? There are some people friends, family, co-workers, neighbors, some people have died and their soul is in heaven and their body is cremated or in a casket. We call this the first death. It's the separation of the body and the soul. The Bible wants us to know about this. For since we believe that Jesus died, not everybody believes this, but we as Christ followers believe that Jesus died and was raised to life again. We also believe that when Jesus returns, This first return is the rapture. The rapture and the second coming are two totally different events that often we get very confused. Second coming of Jesus. Only Christ followers will see Jesus at the rapture. The whole world will see Jesus at his second coming. We tell you, verse 15, we tell you this directly from the Lord. It's not our opinion. This is not kind of some human speak. We tell you this directly from the Lord. We who are still living when the Lord returns will not meet him ahead of those who have died. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God. First, the believers who have died will rise from the grave. So the first thing that happens is all believers who have already died, their body has been cremated or is in a casket, their spirit is in heaven, they are resurrected and they meet the Lord in the air first. Notice exactly what happens next, verse 17. Then together, this is for us, those of us who are living today, then together with them, we who are still alive and remain on the earth will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Then we'll be with the Lord forever. So encourage each other with these words. This is something for us to be excited about. In troubling, turbulent days, God wants us to be up on what he's doing so we can be encouraged. Now, we who are still alive, the Bible uses the term translated our bodies have to change and i'll get to that in just just a moment now i want you to kind of stick with me for just a moment because i got to teach something and although right i've been talking about death and what it's like when you die in your body and your soul and your spirit and all that i want to step in for just a moment to talk about your marriage death <laughs> Marriage, how are those two getting along so good, right? Hang with me, because to understand everything that we're talking about, you really have to understand the history of a Jewish wedding, because God in his word, he's speaking to Jewish men in the gospels, right? Jesus, he's speaking to Jewish men people. And so he would use stories and illustrations about how life was going then to teach a spiritual principle. We in the West see marriage very different. We see marriage in the West like Amazon Prime. Go shopping. We don't like it. Amazon Prime return it real fast, right? However, it's altogether different. And that's why we're often confused about this whole conversation about the rapture and eternity. So in a Jewish wedding, a guy, a girl, they kind of say that they want to get married. The families all agree. The first thing that they would do in that agreement time is they would have a glass of wine as a covenant of this bond that they were in full agreement that they would be getting married. We see that in the 
Christmas story. You got a guy named Joe. You got a girl named Mary. They are espoused together. The next thing that would happen is the groom would say to the bride, this was a very common statement. Hey, listen, I'm going to go and prepare a place for us. And when I get it all done, when I get the house built and I get the business built and I get all the pieces together, get organized, I'm going to come back and get you. They would definitely understand. Now, this groom was motivated to go work on the house and he's motivated to go get the business together because he has paid a price, a dowry price. Now that's not very cultural to us, but men, let me ask you a question. Did you buy her a ring? Did it cost more than one paycheck? You kind of get it, right? There's this sense that, listen, I want her. I'm willing to pay a price for her. I mean, imagine all that you could have done with the cost of that ring. Now, ladies, you're important to us. We love you. We're for you and all that kind of stuff. But there was a price to be paid. Now, a groom, a Jewish man, he wanted, <laughs> he wanted to pay a heavy price, a high price. Why? Because that means he was getting a good-looking Jewish girl. It means that he was getting a girl who honored her father. And she was a good worker, a good servant. So he wanted to pay high dollar value. Now hold that story right there. And let me tell you the story of you and Jesus. Do you remember when we have Easter and we have communion, we have this Eucharist, we have this juice, the wine. First Corinthians chapter 11, it, we, we come, and remember it says, in the same way he took the cup and the wine after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people. You thought that's just an Easter thing. Understand, they knew that to be a marriage thing. That was a wedding thing. That is the agreement that the groom and the bride, Jesus and the church were making this covenant that they were going to be together forever. Take me to the next verse, 1 Corinthians. Notice what happens about Jesus' payment for his bride, the dowry price. God bought you with the highest price, the sacrifice of his son, the Lord Jesus, on the cross. He paid the ultimate price. They understood this. This is marriage talk. Then in John chapter 14, he says, don't let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. Watch this. I'm going away to prepare a place for you. And don't wig out. Don't worry about it. I'm coming back for you. See, the reason marriage, gender, and sexuality is so attacked in the culture today is because the adversary, Satan, Lucifer, understands if he can confuse you about marriage and gender and our sexuality, he can confuse you about our relationship with God and this imminent event called rapture and where we will live for all of eternity in a real place called heaven. He wants you to be confused so you miss heaven and you go to hell understanding marriage and that's why let me say to all the singles in the house I'm for you I know you want to meet her and you want to meet him and you're going to fall in love and you're going to have a magnolia looking house you're going to have a white picket fence and you're going to have the, the no edge sink and you're going to have the mar you're going to have it it's going to look all nice but hear me the ultimate reason to say yes is not for the dress. The ultimate reason to say yes is because you believe you and this other person will live your life telling the story of how much God's love is for you. The groom and the bride, we want my I want my marriage to become the storyline for the world. That, my friends is the reason to get married. I was talking to a single this week and, you know, kind of talking about, you know, statistically and a lot of more singles and particularly in this space, the church space, more singles, and then you have much more marrieds. But then I said to him, I said, I said, hey, listen, let's tease that out for a second. So right now, statistically, you say there's far more singles and there's many more married couples, but then 
Statistically, 50% of marriages aren't going to go the distance. Statistically, there's a whole lot of people on a piece of paper married, but they really are single. Marriage and singleness, number one, is not your identity. Nor are you more or less valued. Marriage is more than a love story. I'm glad for the love story that's a part of it, but it's a determination that I want my life. As Christ followers, we've been bought with a a price and he's coming back to prepare a place. When you understand all of that, now listen to the words of Jesus because he wants us to be prepared. He doesn't want us to be shocked because eternity is permanent Wherever you go, heaven or hell, there is no divorce. Why does God say in the Bible that he hates divorce? Now listen, I know many of us in this gathering, you have been wounded by divorce. And aren't you just grateful? Aren't I just grateful for God's amazing grace and his mercy? You are not less of a person because you are divorced. But God's plan was never for a marriage to come to an end. Why? Because marriage is the picture of the groom Jesus and the church, the bride, and there's no divorce. There's no divorce. Once you're in Christ, you are in Christ today and forever. So here's what Jesus says, so that we're ready. He says, when the Son of Man, that's Jesus, returns, right here, this rapture moment, it could be imminent. When the Son of Man returns, it'll be like in Noah's day similar to our day. In those days before the flood, the people were enjoying banquets and parties and weddings right up to the time Noah entered the boat. That's today. Everybody's chilling. It's a holiday weekend. Some are going to be going to the beach. Some are hanging out, going bike riding. We're going to have hot dogs, cook, whatever it is. We're just hanging out. We're we're living our lives, right? You're going to do something special tomorrow. If you don't have to work, then the kids have to go back to school on Tuesday. We got more bills to play. Come on Friday. We got Gators who are going to win this coming weekend. We're excited. I mean, it's just, right? It's, it's, it's life. We, we get it. Same thing was happening then. Same thing's happening now. Notice verse 39. People didn't realize what was going to happen until the flood came and swept them all away. Isn't that a lot like today? I mean, you have conversations with somebody about their, their, their finances and they're not saving for a rainy day, or whatever, and all of a sudden the flood comes and they're wondering, how did I get in this situation? Or, or a marriage really isn't healthy. Guys, you're not chasing her the same way you chased her to get her. And then we kind of wonder why the marriage didn't work out, right? And there it's like, oh, wait, what, 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 what happened? Remember on the Weather Channel, they're always talking about the storm surge. They're trying to get you, get out of there. We don't want... A casualty, right? The sense of, of warning, right? They're unaware. People didn't realize what was going to happen. I think about the people in Maui and the fire. You know, the, the difference between the hurricane in Florida and the fire in Maui, there was, there, there was no awareness. The, the sirens, they didn't have the Weatherman Channel saying, if, if the storm gets to here, cars start floating. If it gets to here, blah, blah, blah. I mean, they didn't have any of that for 10 days. I mean, it was just like, Their whole community was gone. People didn't realize what was going to happen until the flood came and swept them all away. That is the way it will be when the Son of Man, Jesus, comes. Two men, this is the rapture. This is not the second coming. Two totally different events. Rapture, second coming. We are right here in the timeline of life. Two men will be working together in the field. One will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding flour at the mill. One will be taken, the other left. So you too must keep watch. Be aware because your destination for eternity is permanent. And I don't want anybody to have any regrets for you don't know what day your Lord is coming. Back to this picture up on the big screen here. When the groom and the bride, they shared that cup of wine we share communion. When the dowry price had been paid, Jesus paid the price on the cross for our salvation. When the groom went away and said, hey, listen, I'm gonna go prepare a place for us. When I'm done, I'm gonna come back from you. He didn't give her 
a building timeline. Kind of like today in contracting a builder for your house. You don't know. <laughs> It'd be done next week, next year, 10 years. There ain't no timeline. Whenever it's going to happen, right? And so you didn't, so the bride wasn't getting ready. The bride's job was to be ready because on a certain day, that groom was coming back. There's a whole story that Jesus talks about these 10 virgins who were like chilling and weren't prepared and they missed that moment when the groom came back for the bride. So he's saying, that's why he's saying he wants us to be ready. That's why it says in verse 16, for the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God. That woke you up. I heard it. I heard it. We're going right here. That's not fair, is it? It's like, some of you are like, man, I thought it happened right now. And we didn't have to watch FSU play LSU tonight. I mean, man, we were out of here, right? We didn't have to watch FSU stomp on LSU tonight. Did I get the right coach? Just make sure and I'm getting okay. All right. That's what the Bible says, that we just need to be ready. Don't get ready. First Corinthians 15, 51. The Bible says this, but let me revel, oh, let me revel, let me reveal to you a wonderful, I got that revelry in my mind, but let me reveal to you a wonderful secret. We will not all die, but we will be transformed. When that trumpet sounds, your body, it going to change. If you're still on earth, remember those who have already died, they're in a casket, they were cremated. They are gonna be reunited with their spirit in heaven at this rapture when that trumpet sounds. But what about us peeps that are still here on the earth? Get excited. There are some human beings who will not go through death. We will not have to be cremated and we will not have to be in a casket. I'm just voting for option B. Just let everybody know. Uh, here's what it says in verse 52, watch this. It will happen in a moment in the blink of an eye when the last trumpet is blown. For when the trumpet sounds, those who have died will be raised to live forever. And we who are living will be transformed. Literally what the Bible's saying here, we're gonna be translated. Much like if I was gonna go, if, if I went to Italy and I needed to communicate, I would translate from English to Italian. Or if I went to... China, from Chinese to English. You understand that. That's what's going to happen to this body. The body form that you're in right now, right? If the trumpet sounded and we're going up, guess what? Your body, it can't get through that ceiling. It's matter. It's going to hit. You're going to bump your head. You're going to come back down and you're going to have a headache for a really long time. So the Bible's telling you, because God doesn't want you to be unaware. He wants you to know exactly what's going to happen. Our bodies will be transformed into bodies that will never die. Our mortal bodies must be transformed into immortal bodies. Notice Philippians chapter three. But we are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives and we are eagerly waiting for him to return as our savior. He will take our weak mortal bodies, right? Look at and turn them into his own, just like Jesus, right? And when Jesus was raised from the dead, they recognized him. He said, here, touch my hands. He had bodily form. One cool thing, remember Jesus? Remember when the disciples were huddled in a locked room? What did Jesus do? He walked what? Right through the door. <laughs> we're having the same body as Jeez, now I realize some of us when we're younger, like you're not, I mean, because you, you get up in the morning and life's great. There are no aches and no bruises, no bumps, no, but there's others of us. You get up in the morning and there's some stretching going on and you pay a big bill to the chiropractor, right, along the way. So it's time for us to move past getting ready to being ready. So I know what you're asking. Chris, I know you're looking at me right there. You're saying, okay, Mark, tell me, 
I want to be ready. Get me ready. How many of y'all have a hurricane plan at your house? <laughs> That's about right. <laughs> I mean, every June they tell us it's hurricane season. Get your plan out, right? And you're supposed to have all your supplies. Hey, just a thought. If we had the supplies ahead of time and we are be ready, we wouldn't have to go do all the cray-cray stuff that everybody else would do when we, things got to get. All right, I know I'm meddling now. Sorry, right? Having a plan, having a personal plan. Financial planners in the house. Don't you wish people had a financial plan rather than coming to you when it was all a mess, right? If you have a plan, you work the plan, right? So I'd like to give you a be ready plan. Is that okay? So get your number two pencil out. Let me give you a be ready plan. Let's use us Marines. We understand acronyms because we can't remember too much. So they gave us an acronym. So the word plan stands for something. This is not on the big screen. This is fresh bread. They will have it in your weekend recap. Um, I didn't give this to the first gathering and this is fresh for you. How about that? Yeah, ready? Here's your rapture plan. Start with the letter P, number one, you gotta pray. We didn't, give you these, we didn't give you these little bands just for one day in August. I wear this, it is a constant reminder for me to pray. Let me tell you something. When you have a ongoing conversation with God, you will have a tendency to move from getting ready to be ready. I'm just telling you, prayer, it changes everything. Billy Graham, when they had him reflect back on his life, they asked, Billy Graham, do you have any regrets? And here's the man who reached more people with the gospel of Jesus Christ than any other human being ever lived. He simply said this, I wish I would have prayed more. If that's true for Billy, that's equally true for a guy named Mark David. And you get it, right? Everything rises and falls on communication. Do we have any married women in the house? Are there any? You're that proud of it, are you? <laughs> hey, let me ask you. Would you wish your husband communicated more or communicated less? More. Boom! How, how, how about at, at work, right? In communication from your boss, your employees. Your, hey, let me ask you this. Anybody in the house wish people would respond to their texts? Anybody tired of being ghosting? How about emails? Like, you know, get an email, respond to an email, right? I'm just telling you, we all get it. Communication works. Life is better in my house when I communicate to Linda. I'm happier. My taste buds are satisfied. The rest is none of your business. I'm just telling you, life is good. If that's true in this physical realm, how much more true? in the spiritual realm. So P stands for pray. Are you ready for the L? Ha, ready? Leverage your resources. You wanna move from getting ready to be ready. Understand you ain't taking any of it with you. So like if you got some cash, get online or write a check today for the hurricane relief and let's make a difference up in the panhandle, the Sten, you know, Stenhatchee and Perry, um, Crystal River, uh, I always want to say horse. What's the name of where, where, where it landed? Horse Beach? Horseshoe Beach. Let's, you got some cash. I got $10. Let's get it up into their hands. And here's my commitment is we partner with local churches. So we're not giving it to the government. We're not giving it to Red Cross. Uh, we, we partner with local churches there who will step in and be a source for the felt needs, right? Food, water, diapers, shelter, that kind of stuff, all with the intentions of showing up with the real need of personal relationship with Jesus. Because by the ways, what does it really do to shelter a person, clothe a person, feed a person, and then they go to hell? That's cruel. All right, so leverage your resources. My goodness, if you've got a chainsaw and you've got some time, um, head on up there. If you just, I mean, one of our guys, Jason Lowe, was up there this weekend. He just said he went up there. He walked into a store owner, said, how can I help? The store owner said this. Um, I've been here working at the shop all day. No one's in my house working. Can you go there? He just went, I mean, that, that, that was just random, right? So leverage your resources. How do you get right? When you start leveraging your resources, it gets your mind 
off of this present world and gets your mind on the eternal world. You're moving from getting ready to be ready. Hey, let's just, can we just say be ready out loud real quick? One, two, three. Be ready. And be ready. I mean, it, it feels good to be ready. How many people want someone in their house to be ready? <laughs> Let, let's move from getting ready to, to be ready. Here's, here's A, right? Pray, leverage your resources. Letter A, activate your voice. Stop being silent about Jesus. I'm teaching you this. If anyone should be confident about the death process, it should be Christ followers. And we can step in, we can activate our voice in this season so people understand a personal relationship with Jesus is the only way. I'm, the, one of the ways I've, I've kind of triggered my mind, like when I heard the story about Jimmy Buffett and, um, and you know how it says, RIP, rest in peace. Listen, if you don't know where the person is, one place you ain't resting in peace. Let that, if you let that mindset begin to trigger in your mind, it will move you from being a get ready to a be ready. I want people to be ready, right? Be ready. And then here's the letter M. So pray, here, right, your rapture plan. What's my rapture plan? Pray, ongoing conversation with God. L, leverage your resources. I'm speaking to Christ followers right now. In a moment, your rapture plan, if you're not a follower of Jesus, is to get saved, born again, redeemed. <laughs> Those who are lost, get saved. We'll cover that in a second. This rapture plan is coming from a place that you're already a believer, right? So you're going to pray, ongoing conversation with God. You're going to leverage your resources. Get, just be generous with your time and your cash. You're going to activate your voice, your neighbors, your, your friends, who you're doing life with. Okay, and then the, the last uh, letter is, is now. You, you just not, you, you gotta have a now mindset. I know you gotta think about next week and all the, but today's the only day you get to live. And you will move from a getting ready person to a be ready person when you begin to understand today matters. Thank you. Being together in this space today is really good. If you've never begun a relationship with Jesus, I'd like to invite you today to start following Jesus. It's not about your behavior. It's not about your church attendance. It's about the reality that Jesus is for you. God's not mad at you. He's madly in love with you. Would you right now pray this prayer with me? Hey God, it's me. I've sinned and I know it and I can't fix me. But today I receive you, Jesus, as my savior. I believe that you died on that cross for me and that you were buried for three days and then you became alive again. And I invite you into my life to guide me and direct me all the rest of the days of my life. And with that prayer, my friend, welcome to God's family. I'd like to continue our friendship. If you would email me, pastor at hopeinocala.com. I'll follow up with you, and together we'll celebrate Jesus in your life. Peace.